and the adorption has an extremely small barrier. And now I have CO and it's on that surface. Then it reacts to form It's, ad it's atomistic components, right? It dissociates, in other words. The carbon-oxygen bond breaks, and I get carbon and oxygen. The effective barrier is the difference between these two points, the gas phase and the transition state. It's a negative number in this case. That's because it adsorbs so strongly that this effective barrier is now negative. Okay? Anybody have an issue? Is this clear? All right, one of your homework problems is going to ask you about negative activation barriers. Let's go back and look a little bit more at this K effective. What is this grouping? The equilibrium constant. That's right. Big K1. So what can I say about that first reaction? I can call it quasi-equilibrated. So if I would have told you from the start that this reaction was quasi-equilibrated, right? If I just tell you that on an exam, for instance, to save you time, then you can write the definition of the equilibrium constant for that reaction, which is what? What is K1 equal to? Products over reactants. Wait, can you say that about that one over there too? About which one? Behind you. If you can like take the, the bottom one, take the K1. Can I say it's quasi-equilibrated when it's still in this form? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. No because I've yet to show you that this term is negligible. And it's only when this term is negligible that K effective will be equal to this grouping of constants. In other words, you won't get this ratio in the final form. I mean, you don't have it, right? I know it looks like you have it because I just drew a big circle around it, but it's not there because you have that plus term. Well, I'm saying if you take out like the K1 from the bottom, you can't get these two by themselves without having K1 or K negative 1 somewhere else. And there's no real reason to do it if, you're, if they're still going to be left over. So yeah, somebody said products over reactants. So what is that for this one? Yeah, I'm not even going to write the other, the other A, right? Obviously, if I write them both, they'll just cancel. And so right away, I could have said that A star is equal to the equilibrium constant times A. And if I go back and remind you that we started with K2 times whoops, A, then what do we get when we substitute this into that? We get the exact same rate equation, K2, K1 minus K1 times A, which is the same as K2, big K1 times A. So what is it really, yeah? Is K effective only in that form, or can it be like K2, K1? K effective can be any grouping of, of rate constants that are grouped together. Okay. I mean, that just means that it's some series of Ks times some reactant. So what does it really mean to say that a reaction is quasi-equilibrated? What is mathematically true that we just discussed 
that allows me to say this reaction is quasi-equilibrated? No, those are both true. That, that's the definition of equilibrium. But how do I know that based on the first rate equation that I wrote down? K1? K1. K1. K negative 1, but not just K negative 1. It has to be times A is much larger than K2. Remember, that's what we said that allowed us to go down this rabbit hole. I have to be able to say that this term is much larger than this one and that denominator and then I'll ultimately end up with this rate expression that has this lumped rate constant and then I can rewrite it in terms of the equilibrium constant. So this is what matters. So does it, is it purely a function of activation energies? No. It depends on the condition of the reaction, right? In this case, it depends on the concentration of A. Yeah? So will the ramp overall reaction be quasi equilibrated with respect to the second step or the first step or something like that? The first step will be quasi equilibrated. What about the second step? Is that quasi equilibrated? No, it's irreversible, and that's just what you call it. Which one of these two is rate determining, though? The first one's rate determining? It's called the equilibrium. It's the second. This is the rate determining step. In other words, if I slow down this step, the rate slows down. Now, what is the net rate of this reaction compared to this reaction? R1 plus R minus 1, leave a box here, to R2. Do we know anything about those relationships? I think I heard somebody say it. They're equal. That's right. Rate determining steps are not slow steps. All of these steps have the exact same net forward rate. Otherwise, you would be building up A star. And we've already said that A star does not accumulate within the system. We said that I could write the rate of formation of A star is zero. So that means that the net rate here is equal to this rate. So don't call a rate determining step slow, or I will be angry. It is simply rate determining, meaning that it controls the rate of the reaction. Its intrinsic thermodynamics are what determine the rate of the reaction. OK? They all occur at the same rate. What you mean to ask is, if I had equal concentrations of all reactants, but that's, that's a very awkward thing to say, right? They're not slowest. They're just intrinsically slowest. Their intrinsic rate is slowest. But it depends on the concentration of the reactants. Another way to think about a rate determining step is if I look at K effective, if I look back at K effective, you see that I can write it as a product of rate constants. But you guys also told me that one of those is really, this grouping is really an equilibrium constant. So now I have a rate constant times an equilibrium constant, right? That's the rate determining step. It's the one whose rate constant shows up in K effective. As opposed to the other step, it's not the rate constant that shows up, it's the equilibrium constant. And so if I go back to an example where I have step one, and then I've got step two, Which one of those is rate determining? If that's the reaction coordinate diagram, meaning that I know the relative values of all of the activation energies. Do you know if I only tell you the reaction coordinate diagram? 
You need what? Well, you can tell that. I mean, trust my drawing. The activation energy for step one is larger than that for step two. So does that tell me which one is rate determining? What did I say? K minus one times what? A had to be much larger than K2. Is there anything about the pressure of A on that diagram? No. So you cannot look at a reaction coordinate diagram and tell me which step is rate determining. This is the condition that has to be true in order for step one to be quasi-equilibrated and step two to be irreversible. Well, we always say that it's irreversible, but to be the sole rate determining step. That has to be true. Yeah? So if we initially said K negative one A is much, much less than K two, right. would that flip would K sorry, would reaction two be quasi equilibrium? No, obviously not because it's not reversible. But would it then be the rate determining step? Would, I guess so. Which one would we're about to do that exact example. Oh, okay. But okay. yeah, if that inequality was flipped, rate one or reaction one is rate determining. And reaction two is simply irreversible. It's not quasi equilibrium. Be right. careful with that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, why is the R1 plus R negative 1 equals R2? Uh, could you explain that again? Sure. We said that the rate of change of A star with time was equal to zero. And we wrote out R A star was equal to, you remember? is R1 plus R minus 1 minus R2. And then we set it to zero. That is that. It's the exact same equation. Yeah? Could be minus R negative 1? Probably. Yeah. Yeah. And this should be minus 2. Sorry about that. F make sure to fix that in your notes. It's the net rate of reaction 1. The net rate, which is the forward minus the reverse. If I tell you that step one is quasi-equilibrated, right, then you know that K effective is equal to this grouping. What is the effective activation energy? Can I draw it on this diagram? It's the difference between what two points? Which cap? Yeah, the difference between what two points? This one and what else? The first is second activation. Second transition state. That's what these points are, the second transition state. This is delta E A effective, the effective activation energy for this reaction. Another way to know, and again, I had to, I had to tell you that. I can't just give you the coordinate diagram. I have to tell you that step one, or you have to tell me that step one is quasi-equilibrated for you to know that that's true. But, you know, another thing that you'll notice is the position of this transition state doesn't matter. Right? Did that change the effective barrier? No. Because that first step is quasi-equilibrated. Its transition state doesn't matter. What about now? Yeah, of course. That has limits. Right? <laughs> but remind, I'll remind you that this can still be quasi-equilibrated. Because if I have enough A around, then even if that activation barrier for the reverse reaction is really, really large, I've, if I've got enough A, sorry, A star around, then it overwhelms it. OK. So let's move on to that second example, or the second case.
Yeah, so in the example where Before I said anything about what was larger than what, now what if this is the dominant term? What does this simplify to? A1, A squared. What happened to K2? It cancels out. Which step is rate determining? Now this is K effective, which kind of begs the question of why we would even write that, right? Because it is simply the rate constant for a single step. And what shows up inside of K effective is just K1. So the first reaction is rate determining. Does that mean the second reaction is quasi-equilibrated? No, right? It's still an irreversible reaction. And you can call it that. It simply doesn't determine the rate of the reaction. Yeah? Isn't the quasi equilibrated one than what the criteria is for? Yeah. Quasi equilibrated means that this is true. In this case, A star over A. Right? The only time that that's true for this reaction is if this term is much larger than that term because then what will happen is the A's cancel out and all of these things collapse into big K and you end up with the exact same reaction. So it can happen if you have really, really high pressures of A or if the reverse barrier, which goes into K minus 1, is much smaller than the forward barrier, which goes into K2. Either one of those can be true. But it simply means that term is larger than the other. All right, let's look at another type of reaction that we observe a lot. Yeah? What would be like the general definition of quantum There is no general definition. The general definition is derive the full rate equation and look at what has to happen in order for that to be true. Yeah. It, it means that by the time you write the final rate equation, you could have started with the assumption this step is equilibrated. And you would have ended up with the exact same rate equation. That's, that's one way to generally state that, it, that it's true. In other words, Recognizing that the forward and reverse rates might be different doesn't change the rate equation. So can we say that it's always QE if there's a big K? Is that always true? You don't know that there's a big K when you start. I just give you a sequence of reactions and you're going to derive a rate equation. But if I were to hand you a rate equation in which there is a large K, then yes, that would mean that the only way that that rate equation would be valid is if that step is equilibrated. Depending on where it shows up. Like you asked earlier, you can rearrange the, this form in order to write it in terms of big K, but that doesn't actually change anything, right? So if you only see big K1, but you don't see any of the little K1s, then what you ask is true. But if you see little K1s, then, those, then that step is not quasi-equilibrated. All right, chain reactions. These follow three generic or general steps. Anybody know? I think you guys have seen this before. Initiation. Initiation. Propagation. Propagation. 